this holy calling. Write that down, this holy calling. Have you ever lost something precious to you? Maybe you've lost some jewellery, maybe you've lost some cash. For me, a few years ago, I was in the shopping centre or if you're in the US of A, uh, the shopping mall, if that's what you call it. We're walking around, I had my two kids with me at the time, Willow and Jack. Jack was about maybe four or five years old at the time. And Laura wasn't there, so this is just a recipe for disaster already. We're walking around the shopping centre and uh, it was crowded. Everywhere you looked, I mean, there were individuals, people everywhere. And I'm one of those window shoppers, right? And I love to kind of just go and look in the window and just kind of dream. Yeah, that'll look great. Oh, those shoes. And I must have got distracted and fixated on something that I thought was important to me. And I was like window shopping and I can remember Willow was by my side and we got fixated on this particular uh, this store and this, these, these items that I saw for sale. And next thing you know, I looked around and I couldn't see Jack anywhere. My four-year-old, five-year-old, I was like asking Willow, where's Jack? Where's your brother? And I even started to blame Willow. Where, where, what did you do with him? Where is he? Like, where is Jack? And parents, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, two minutes is interstellar time. Like it feels like five hours. I mean, I'm running through the store. I'm sending Willow. I'm saying, Willow, do not tell your mom nothing. Like this didn't even happen. We're running around the store. We're looking and calling, Jack, Jack. I mean, you can imagine that my heart rate picked up. My, my, my palms were sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. You know, that kind of vibe. And I was looking around and I was like, oh my goodness. I've lost something so precious to me. It's so great to have a few laughs in here as well. Thank you for laughing at my, my, my jokes. Um, it's been a long while since anyone's laughed at my jokes. I appreciate it. South Africa, I know you're laughing as well. This is great. And I was looking around and pushing through the crowds, looking for my son. I'd lost something so precious to me. You'd be happy to know that we found Jack. He was in another store and we found him talking to this, well, what is only looked like a really lovely old lady that was trying to help him get back to his parents. But have you ever lost sight of something so precious to you? Here's my question. Have you ever lost sight of your calling? Have you ever lost sight of something so precious like the holy calling God put on your life? Have you ever lost sight of what God purposed you for? Disappointment, discouragement, A pandemic perhaps has crowded your life and you've lost sight. I think if we're all honest in this past season, we've all been in where social media, media opinions and loud voices are no doubt crowding our space and no doubt we begin to lose sight of something so precious, our calling. Tonight, I wanna remind you whilst you may have lost sight of your calling. Maybe you're right now joining us online or in one of our campuses in the room right now. Whilst you may feel like you've lost sight of something so precious, let me tell you this, God has not lost sight of you. God has not lost sight of you. You may feel like you're out there isolated, alone, wondering if God still sees me. You may feel like being overlooked. You may feel like, does anyone really see what I'm going through? Let me just tell you right now, there is a God in heaven who is near to the cross, who is near to the brokenhearted. And let me tell you right now, even though you may feel distant, He is not distant from you. In fact, He calls you. For Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says this, For God's gifts and His call are irrevocable. Do you know what that means? It means His gifts, His call are unchangeable. That's the great thing about this calling. This holy calling we have, it's not initiated by us, it's initiated by Him. It is Him who calls. Oh yeah, we sing songs where I called and He answered and He's a God who answers. But guess what? He's a God who initiates and He calls out to that which is crushed and that which is in isolation and that which is in a mess. He is the God that calls each and every one of us. You may be sitting there going, what's this calling you're talking about, Togsy? See, there's different types of calling throughout the Bible. You'll see there's the, the calling of salvation. 
First and foremost, our relationship with Jesus. This is utmost imperative, so important to have this relationship with Jesus. There's the call of to be a part of redemptive work here on earth. That is being a part of His church and in His community. And I'm looking at this space here. Whilst there aren't many people here right now, I look forward to the day when we are all together, called to be as one in community, unified together, because we're called to be a part of the redemptive work of Christ in our lives. We're called to subdue the earth, to take dominion, to increase. In Genesis 1, God says, go forth, multiply, hello, increase. And, you know, start to take dominion, start to subdue the earth. We're called to work. We're called to have a career. We're called to have a path. We're called in in, in an avenue of life, a lane in life that we're all called to run to. And it's not one or the other. I think tonight I'm talking about everything in that. This holy calling that we have. I love what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 8 and 9, it says this, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord God, nor of me as His prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Look at this. Who has what? Saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. You see, this holy calling has nothing to do with just our gifts and our talents and our skill or our personality or how popular we are. It has everything to do with who Christ Jesus is and what Christ Jesus has done. And that's why when we are called, we are called according to His grace, His purpose. When we are called to outwork His plan, on this earth has got nothing to do with me and you. It's got everything to do with Him. If you read on a little bit further into 2 Timothy, Paul is reminding Timothy of his calling, in fact. Because if you read on a little bit into 2 Timothy chapter 4, you'll start to see that Timothy is beginning to come up against mountainous problems within the church. Persecution is wreaking havoc throughout the community. And Paul seems to remind young Pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, he says, preach the Word. Be prepared in and out of season. What's he saying here? See, preach the Word. Be instant in other translations or be prepared. It's taken from this military term to stick your heels in, to stand guard, to stay in your calling, to stay in the fight because I've got a suspicion. Perhaps Timothy looking all around him, seeing persecution wreaking havoc and maybe the mountainous internal problems going on within the community and the church. He probably wanted to step back, withdraw, hold back and run. But Paul says, let me remind you, Timothy, of what you're called to. Preach the Word in good times, in bad times. Stay true to what God has called you to. See, we all have this this precious calling, precious cargo. Maybe when you first got your driver's license, do you remember when you first went for a drive? You're probably a little bit reckless. You probably missed the stop sign here and there. You probably didn't indicate. You probably went over the speed limit a little bit. But how many of you know for guardians and parents, grandparents, it all changes when you have some little ones in the car, right? You're driving. I remember when I first drove my newborn out of a hospital. Everyone else on the road was a maniac except this car, right? Because you knew you had precious cargo in the back. So it is with our calling. This is precious. This calling is to be guarded at all costs. This calling cannot be ruled by narratives happening around and about us by different people's opinions. This calling, it's a holy calling and it must be entrusted with faithfulness, diligence. See, because it's been given by the Holy of Holies. God gives it to each and every one of us and it can't just be thrown and scattered, but it must be guarded with everything. I wanna look at a story tonight, if it's okay. Pastor Brian this morning uh, preached an incredible message. And if you can, you need to get your hands onto it uh, on our various different uh, YouTube platforms or, you know, uh, hillsong.com forward slash online. He talked about Joseph. Tonight, I want to talk about Joseph's dad, Jacob. 
I want to look at the story of Jacob found in Genesis 35 and you can look and turn there with me. And whilst you're doing that, let me just kind of set a little bit of a backdrop for you. You may know Jacob. Jacob's well known for the the guy that wrestled with God. I will not leave you, you know, uh, until I feel your, your presence, something along those lines. He's the guy that stole his brother's blessing. I mean, his life is nothing short of adventurous, chaotic, all at the same time. Remember, remember Jacob. Now, Jacob has this encounter with God in Genesis. Genesis 28. He he has this dream. He falls asleep at a certain place and he has this vision of God and God speaks to him and he wakes up from that dream. And in Genesis 28 verse 17, it goes on that he has this encounter with God and look at this. He wakes up from this dream. Look at what he says. He says, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Well, in Genesis 28, he sets out on this journey. He goes, this place is awesome. Bethel, the house of God. He says, this place is awesome. How good is this place? This is the place where I encountered God. This is the place where I met Him. This is the place where He gave me a dream. He gave me a calling. He gave me a vision. And then he sets out on this journey in Genesis 28. In fact, if you read on in Genesis 28, he makes a promise to God that I'm gonna come back to this place that you called me to. But I'm about to set out on a journey And I'm about to set out on this journey and God, I'm gonna come back. I promise you I'm coming back to the house of God. I promise you I'm coming back to Bethel. Well, you read on from Genesis 28, between Genesis 28 and Genesis 35. Well, all hell starts to break loose. Things begin to happen to his family. In chapters 34, you'll read it. It's one of the most godless chapters, not one mention of God's name. Things begin to happen and we land in Genesis 35 where I can only imagine that Jacob is in a place of, well, disaster. He's looking around, kind of going, what's on? He had settled in a place he was called to pass through. See, he had settled in this place called Shechem. Shechem, is that how you say it? Shechem. Yeah, we're all good here. Shechem. See, he was meant to go back to Bethel, but he settled in a place called Shechem. Shechem also happened to be the place of his forefathers, the, the place where Abraham made a covenant with God and he had, stepped, he had stayed with the past generation's vision of God. And I want you to watch this. Look at this in Genesis 35 verse 1. God turns up. God turns up and He calls out to Jacob. Read this with me. Look at this. Genesis 5 35 verse 1. It says, Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel. In other words, go back to where you met me and settle there. Look at this. And build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Reads on and it goes in verse 20, verse two, it says, So Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves. Change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Look at this. So they gave Jacob everything, foreign gods. They had the rings, their ears, their jewelry, their tight jeans, the holes in the jeans and their tight shirts and their singlets and everything. And Jacob buried them under the oak of Shechem. Then they set out and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. I wanna just make a few observations here when it comes to Jacob's life. And I just wanna apply them to our lives. And perhaps God can speak to you in these few moments. Write this down with me. The first thing is this. This holy calling, according to Jacob, is lived from the altar. Look at this in verse three. Then come, let us go to Bethel where I will build an altar to God. You see, it's evident that Jacob possibly had drifted from the altar. What's the altar? The altar, that place of why. That first love. Altars in the Bible, in the Old Testament, represented this place of commemoration. It represented a place where humans would interact and encounter with God. And God interacted with humans and responded to altar activity. And the altar was the place of a sacrifice. It was a place to to see the Spirit of God move. And you see, what happens here is God calls him back to the altar because he had drifted from his first love. He had forgotten the foundational days of where it all began for him, where he encountered God and he declared, this place is awesome, but he drifted and he went on a journey and he got stuck and he settled in Shechem. I remember the day when 
I married the girl of my dreams. I saw this girl at seven years old. When I was just seven years old, I saw the girl of my dreams. You're wondering who I'm talking about. I'm talking about my wife, Laura. That's who I'm talking about. And seven years old, I saw her. And one day my mind said, that's the girl for me. Anyway, she didn't notice me till 19 years later, which is all good. Friends owned me, that really hurt. And we got married in 2008. And I remember the day we got married. And I've got a picture, in fact, that maybe you can have a look at. This is us being married at the altar. Now, I remember the day so clearly because, I mean, I think in this picture, I'm like, like one of those ugly cries, you know, like, oh, like I'm crying because I'm looking at the doors and the doors fling open and it's like birds came out and, 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 and then Laura in, 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 in just her, in who she was, in her elegance, she just stepped out. And that's where I just began, my, my eyes just began to well up with tears and I couldn't hold myself together. Like I even thought, I think I, I, I crouched over and I was like, oh my goodness, because my dreams were coming true. She walked down and, you know, after her 20 bridesmaids that came down the aisle, she, she came and she walked down and I locked eyes with her and I was like, oh my goodness. But you see, it's what took place at the altar where we exchanged promises, where we had communion and we communed with each other and we said that we'd live for one another and we said that through sickness and health, through the good seasons and the bad seasons, we would stay together, we would live together, we would love each other, we would be faithful. You see, that altar, that one decision impacted the choices. See, in that moment, in that altar, we said yes to one and no to anyone or anything else because that place was a place of exchange and as a symbol of our love, we exchanged rings. We exchanged our love for each other. This is what the altar was. And perhaps Jacob had drifted. What about you and I? See the altar, we get good at visiting the altar and by all means, visit the altar, visit those altar calls, visit the place where you come and you receive prayer. And I can't wait when church gets back together and we get to pray and we get to bring people up the front. It's absolutely beautiful. But guess what? The altar wasn't just meant to be visited. The altar was meant to be lived from. We're called to live our lives from the altar. We're called to live this life of sacrifice where our calling, this holy calling, isn't just about us, me, myself and I, but this calling is about others and reaching people and reaching and influencing those around and about us. We must make sure that we do not drift from the altar. You see, there's a real enemy that wants to get you distracted like I was in that shopping centre. I got distracted and fixated on something that truly wasn't that important. And I lost sight of something so precious to me. You see, we gotta make sure that we keep the why behind the what and we keep understanding our purpose here on earth is found at the altar where God encountered us and we encountered Him. And right there, we call that place. This place is awesome. Never forget to stay and live your life from the altar. See, we look for ways to alter our lives, but our lives is not about altering behaviour, altering addresses, altering careers, altering uh, relationships. It's about living from the altar. This is what it is to have a holy calling. You see, this holy calling, write this down, is not built on preference. It's lived out of conviction. You see, verse two, it says this in Genesis 35, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. I wonder what sort of mindsets, I wonder what sort of habits and patterns that Jacob picked up whilst he was in Shechem. On this journey where he said to God, I'm coming back. I wonder between Genesis 28 and Genesis 35, what happened? What habits did he pick up? What sort of thinking patterns? What, what, how, how comfortable did he get? You see, it's evident that he developed a casual attitude and indifference towards God because he settled down somewhere that he wasn't meant to settle down. You see, he was meant to move towards Bethel. You see, the calling of God on our lives, this holy calling, you see, it must be, built on not preference, it must be built on conviction. You see, conviction about our calling will always outweigh comfort. Guess what? 
Calling is costly. You see, following Jesus, it is inconvenient, uncomfortable and costly. See Mark 8, 34, Jesus says Himself the way of the cross. Then He called the crowd to, to Him along with His disciples. And He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must what? Deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. You see, we live in the world where we are uh, for self-preservation. We look for the glamour in the calling. We look for the comfort in the calling. We look for the convenience in the calling. You see, we also live in that society where I want to do it my way and God can follow my way and my agenda and my list. But you see, I've discovered something. My preference isn't always God's preference. My preference isn't always God's preference. You see, if Jesus is the ultimate truth and the way, then He's the way. But the thing is, in my life, sometimes I feel like I've created a sidekick Jesus. I call it the sidekick Jesus. You know what sidekick Jesus is? He's the Jesus that agrees with me on everything. He goes with the flow and everything. He does what I wanna do. He's the sidekick Jesus. He's the Jesus that agrees with you and me all the time. He's the Jesus that just comforts me in my decisions and what I do. He's the Jesus that just follows my agenda and whatever I've got to do. But no, 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 no. You see, we must choose purpose over preference. You see, it's not about my favourite this or my favourite that. I like this about that preacher. I like this about that Bible verse. I like this about that singer. You see, it's about understanding we have a purpose. And when you have a holy calling, purpose will always trump preference because because following Jesus is inconvenient. It challenges my human nature. Can you imagine when Jesus called the disciples? When they're out fishing, Peter, James and John, Jesus turned up, this is what He did. He said, hey, follow me. And then He kept walking. That's what He did. If I was Jesus, I would have been like, hey, at your earliest convenience, when you can, um, do, do you like walking? Do, 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 you, do you like persecution? Do you like sleeping on rocks and being homeless? Three years, I need you to give me three years. Like I, I would probably kind of let them know what they're about to get into, but Jesus said, no, follow me. But the Bible says they immediately dropped their nets. They weren't living by the preference of their life. They were living by the purpose and conviction on their life. Jesus' teachings are inconvenient because it challenges our human nature. Jesus says, love your enemies. No! Jesus said, you've heard about loving your neighbour and that's good. But I'm asking you to take it to the next level and do something inconvenient, something you don't want to do because loving our neighbour is super easy. We can bless our neighbour because our neighbours sometimes, they haven't really done us wrong. But loving your enemies? Are you serious, God? That's inconvenient, exactly. Because I'm a God that He wants you to live by conviction and purpose, not by your preference. My preference wants to just sit back. My preference wants to be comfortable. My preference wants to relax. My preference, I'd rather just take it easy. My preference is I'd rather just do what I want. But you see, even Jesus goes on and He teaches us, if you want to save your life, you must lose it in order to gain it. Mark 8, 35, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the Gospel will save it. Following Jesus, it's not about preference. It's about conviction. It's about understanding. I know that I know that I know I'm called. I know that I know that I was not meant to be in Shechem. I know that I know that I know God has called me to be in Bethel. I know that I know. See, see, the, 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 like the blind man that was healed, right? Remember the blind man? They're saying, what did Jesus do? And he says, look, I don't know. All I know is that I, I, I was blind, but now I can see you folks talking to me. See, that's a conviction, that's understanding. Look, I've had an encounter with God. I don't know much. I can't give you what to say. I don't know what to say. But all I know is I have this conviction that He changed my life and He changed my world and He's flipped my world upside down and now I'm following Him. That's called living out of conviction. The last thing is this, this holy calling. It's not shaped by culture's narrative. It's shaped by God's Word. Look at what it says. Get rid of the foreign gods. In Genesis 35, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you. 
and purify yourselves. I wonder what patterns, what narratives, what beliefs Jacob picked up in a place that he settled down. I wonder the thoughts and the habits, the thinking patterns that were waging war within himself, caught up in different narratives and beliefs about his capabilities, God's capabilities. See, how we think is so important. See, I love what it says in Romans 12, because I think it's a great reminder for all of us that we must allow God's Word to shape our calling. This is a holy calling. We cannot allow culture's narrative to determine what our calling looks like. In Romans 12, verse one, you may know this. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Look at this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, I love what the Passion Translation says. It says this, look at this, it's straight down the line. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in God's eyes. You see, what happens, this is what happens. This is what I find I do, okay? What happens is I get this narrative in my mind about someone. That person doesn't like me. That's the narrative, because we all got narratives going on in our mind. I go, that person doesn't like me. So I decide, you know what? I'm gonna text them. That person doesn't reply. See, I told ya. That confirms the narrative, they don't like me. Maybe they were just busy. It's like, you know, you have this narrative, that person doesn't like me. And then you go to social media and then you look and you know, when they've invited all the friends to that dinner and the only person that's missing is me. See, I told you. And this is what we do. But you see, as believers, we don't run to culture to confirm the narrative or the thought patterns that are going on in our world. No, no, no. We run to the Word of God first and the Word shapes us. You see, because my human nature runs to narrative and I can tell you right now, I can always find what I'm looking for. You see, we shouldn't live lives that believe everything we think. I need to run to the Word. You know why? Because the Word illuminates dark parts in me. The Word lets me know sometimes Togsy, you think they're different. Sometimes you're thinking down this path that's of destruction. And I need the Word to contend with me. I need the Word not to confirm what's going on in my head. No, 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 I wanna open up the Word and I need it to challenge me. I need it to read me. I need it to contend with me. I need it to flip me inside out and help me make better decisions in my life. But the problem is sometimes what I do is I have this narrative and I have this thought about my calling and then I run to, Culture, and it confirms sometimes the negative side and everything I don't like about my calling. And I go, see, but that's not how our lives were meant to be lived. Our lives were never meant to be shaped by the narrative of culture. It was always meant to be shaped by God's Word. This holy calling. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 to 4, it says this, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want them to hear. They will turn from their, their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. It got quiet in here for some reason. Are you guys all good out there? You all right? It's this heavenly calling. It's this holy calling. The band can come and join me. It's this heavenly calling. Hebrews 3, verse 1, and I'm finishing up. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in this heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. I'll finish with this and we're going to worship and pray for people. Many years ago, uh, it was my birthday. I can't remember what birthday it was, but I got invited by all my friends. And they were some church, some unchurched, but they're like, Tugsy, we're going to go out and we're going to live it up, man. It's your birthday. I'm like, yeah. So we get in the car and they're like, we're going to go to this nightclub. And I'm like, yeah. I've never really been to a nightclub. I kind of grown up in church most of my life, but they're like, Tugsy, this is your night. 
We're going to go and get lit, man. For the parents out there, lit, you know, it's like crazy. Woo. So we're driving, we arrive at this nightclub, we park and we walk into this nightclub and they're like, yeah, Tugsy, yeah. I'm like, yeah. We get to the queue and we're lining up. Long story short, as I'm lining up, I can see into this football tunnel. People are going in, people are coming out and people are, look like they're having the time of their lives. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is great. I'm about to get my boogie on. I'm about to meet someone. This is going to be great. So then I, as I'm lining up in the queue, my friends are going in. We meet the bouncer and, you know, that they show their ID, they're going in. And as I'm about to pull out my wallet and show my ID, I promise you, God turned up. I felt like God put His hand on my chest that night. He said, you're not going anywhere. I was like, yeah, I am. He's like, no, 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 no. I haven't called you to this life. I felt like God that night stopped me in my tracks. And He said something to me. And He said, I have called you. I've set you apart. And this is not the life you will live. Everything in me wanted to walk into that nightclub because everything in me wanted to just be living my life in the moment because it felt good. But God stopped me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. And as I was pulling out my wallet, I looked at it and I put it back in my pocket. I decided I'd turn my back on that particular environment and I'd walk away whilst my friends partied on. Six hours, I had to wait for them. I didn't have a driver's license at the time. So I walked around Sydney CBD and I had an encounter with God where He reminded me of what I was called to. And you see, this is the holy calling we have. It's precious cargo. And whilst we wanna settle down, this holy, is too, this holy calling is too precious to let go of. There is an enemy that wants to rip you off, that wants to steal, kill and destroy. But we must dig in. We must like Timothy, stay in the fight. We must put a fight up and go, no, this is a holy calling. And I believe God's called you to whatever avenue, path He's called you to. You have been called. You have been set apart. This is our holy calling. I'm gonna pray and the team are gonna to begin to lead us. Stay with us because I really wanna pray for a few groups of people. Father, I just pray You'd seal this Word in what's happening right now. Lord, I thank You for Your presence. No doubt is felt in this room, but Lord, in every other room. Lord, may we live lives that live our life from the altar. May we live lives out of conviction. May we live lives, God, that understand Your purpose over our lives. God, it's a life worth living. Lord, it is a life lived for You. Lord, Your glorious plans. Father, I pray, God, that You would begin to work in people's lives. Lord, You'd begin to speak to people in South Africa right now. God, work wonders in their life. Remind them of what You've called them to. Father, I believe, God, You're working something throughout Australia, Lord, throughout the globe. God, remind people to come back to that place at the altar, to live their life out of conviction, Father, in the Name of Jesus. Come on, would you stand with me? Come on, would you worship with us? God's going to move. In a few I moments. see you pressing ahead In telling grandma as to the enemy's camp You still do miracles You will do what you say people right now. Someone right now watching or maybe even in this room, maybe on the chat right now, you need a reminder of God's calling on your life. Maybe like me, you've lost, you know, what's precious to you. 
The great thing is God never lost sight of you. He still calls you. His calling is irrevocable. If that's you in the chat, I want you to write something along the lines of, I need a reminder. Write that, put it in big capital letters. If you're comfortable, say, I need a reminder because I'm gonna believe right now in this moment, God's gonna begin to remind you in your living room, in your campus, in whatever room you're gathered in right now, He's gonna remind you of the calling on your life. So right now, come on, write it in the chat. I need a reminder. I need a reminder. Already people are responding. Yes, I need that reminder. Father, remind people of what You have called them to. God, remind people of what You have set them apart for. God, that this calling, they're born for such a time as this. Lord, this time that we're living in. So it may feel uncertain. It may feel unprecedented and crazy. But God, You've called Your people for such a time as this. So remind them, remind them, God. Remind them right now, people needing a reminder of their purpose and their calling. I need a reminder. Remind them, God. Holy Spirit, speak, breathe new, fresh life into what they're doing, who they are. We thank You for what You're doing in Jesus' Name. Amen, amen. I really feel in my heart, we've only got a few moments, but to pray for different callings. Now, I know you can't just reduce calling down to just a career path, although I think it has a whole lot to do with it, uh, our calling and what we choose to do. But I really just had it in my heart to pray for a few groups of uh, people. And listen, I know I'm not gonna pray for every single thing. So for the sake of time, don't feel like God hasn't called me because we didn't pray for it. No, it's just, we ran out of time. That's the reality, okay? But I wanna pray right now. I really felt in my heart, God's raising up people in ministry giftings. Now we've all been blessed with ministry giftings to work with people and to preach to people. But I really feel God's really calling people right now to ministry. To, to when I say ministry, preaching, teaching, pastoral care, caring for the broken, salvation. You know, I really got in my heart that perhaps maybe the next Billy Grahams are watching on right now. Maybe the next Reinhard Bonkies right now are watching on. Maybe the next Pastor Brian and Bobby Houston's and Joyce Myers of the globe, Christine Keynes are being raised up right now. But you feel like you have that calling on your life. I really believe God wants to remind you, young people right now, God wants to remind you, inspire you again, that He's called you for such a time as this. And we need the church in this time to rise up and continue to take her place in humanity because God is coming back for His church and He's looking for people who are willing to do the work of the Lord. If that's you right now, I want you to write in the chat, say, that's me, ministry. Say it, that's me, ministry. Put it in the chat and we're gonna begin to pray for you right now. Already people responding, Father, right now, Lord, in this room, in other rooms, God, I believe, Father, in the Name of Jesus, Lord, that You are calling the next generation, Lord, of people, God, to rise up. Lord, the next preachers, the next teachers, Lord, the next revivalists. Father, they're being raised up right now to take their place in history. And so God, I pray You'd call them, You'd set them apart for such a time as this in Jesus' Name. Remind them of what You've put on their life. Yeah, many people, that's me, ministry. That's me, ministry. Okay, one more group of people. I really feel it on my heart to pray for people right now. Uh, you, you feel called uh, to this space of entertainment entertainment, being an athlete or being at, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to do with radio, to do with singing or whatever it is. I just felt it on my heart to just pray for people right now. You feel called to be in that entertainment industry, maybe a producer, maybe a director, maybe in film, uh, maybe in theatre and arts, whatever it is. I feel like I, 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 I could be in theatre. I, I would 100% do theatre. Um, but if that's you right now, say, yeah, that's me, entertainment. All right, that's me, entertainment. Amen, people are beginning to respond, Father, right now, call them. We need people to rise up. Lord, in our culture today, we need people to rise up. God fearing men and women, God, who rise up, be influencers. Lord, they will not bow down to culture, they will influence culture. And God, I speak that over every person right now responding. That's me, God, right now in the entertainment industry. Lord, being an athlete, being at movie stars, being at singers, God, people right now being, being raised up, God. You're appointing people right now for, for such a time as this. In Jesus' Name I pray, Amen, Amen. Listen, before I hand it back to JD, I wanna pray for you right now. Those of you that need to make a decision to follow Jesus. Have you made that decision? Whatever room you're gathered in, stop still for a moment. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus? Have you asked Him into your life? If you haven't, then I would love to lead you in this simple, powerful prayer that asks Jesus to be Lord and Saviour of your life. 
If you're saying, yeah, that's me, Peter, would you lead me in this prayer you're about to pray? I'm about to pray it. And listen, God loves you. He has a plan, He has a purpose for your life. Remember, He calls you. Maybe at one time you made this decision, but you know in your heart, you drifted, you got distracted, you walked away. He never walked away from you. He loves you. And today, maybe you need to draw a line in the sand. You need a brand new beginning. I'm praying for you right now, friend. If that's you, I want you right now, say this prayer after me, okay? Say it out loud. Say it, say it with faith in your heart because this is between you and God. Maybe you've never made this decision. This is your, your time right now. Say this, dear Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my heart. Come live in me. Lead me, guide me, forgive me of all my wrongdoing. I choose you now forevermore. I surrender all in Jesus' Name. Amen, amen. Come on, let's really congratulate everyone making that decision. We love you guys. Uh, JD's gonna let you know of further instructions for those people that made that decision. It's the best decision you'll ever make in Jesus' Name.